Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth in the HLB International Tax Webinar Series. This month, we will be discussing Brexit, a very timely topic, We're talking about the final countdown. Today, today on our panel, we have Jason, Jason Maria Rathenham from HLB Vandal in the Netherlands. He's a senior consultant there. We have Caroline Monk from Beaver and Struthers, an executive partner, and Andrew Mosby from Menzies, a partner there as well. Now, Brexit is just about a month away and uh, there's a lot gonna happen. So Andrew, you wanna get us started? You know, What do you think the key actions that businesses worldwide should be thinking about and doing right now? Thanks, Kimberly. Um, you're absolutely right, it's, it's not long to go at all um, and the biggest challenge for any Brexit commentator is the moving target nature of the beast. Um, I'm sure everyone would agree. Um, at, at its core there's um, really only one question at the moment is will there be a deal or will there not be a deal? Um, so we're kind of running out of time a little bit so it's looking a little bit more like a no deal and I think uh, Today we're planning on discussing quite a lot of the um, uh, things that we need to think about in a no deal scenario. But even if we do get some sort of withdrawal deal, deal in place, um, we'll have similar issues, albeit they'll be spread over a longer period, uh, perhaps to December 2020 or even into 2021. And there'll be a hopefully a, some sort of trading agreement reached but in the spirit of moving targets um, we have got the next key date coming up and uh, even this morning the Prime Minister has put put that on the 12th of March there'll be another agreement to accept the deal or if not um, to perhaps a, um, accept a short delay so that even might not be accepted by the EU. So, as you say, what should we be doing in a no deal situation? Um, there's some simple things we could be getting right. Um, and the first thing I would, whenever a client of mine asks me what we should be doing, um, I would say, particularly for retailers, ensure the shelves and the warehouses are full. Get your inventory right. Um, that's simple for some, um, but more challenging for others. If you're dealing with perishable goods, if you have a just-in-time stock inventory system, then that is challenging. And also, if you don't have the storage, um, that can be a challenge. Um, similarly, um, you can look at domestic alternatives. Um, I think whilst we will talk a lot about some of the delays that there may be, I think there may be some opportunities um, domestically, both in the UK and also in the EU. So um, I think one of the key things we need to, to think about is factoring in some delays between goods transferring both in and out of the UK and mainland Europe. Hopefully that'll be a short term thing. And um, Caroline, I know we'll elaborate a little bit on some of the issues surrounding those areas. Um, so I won't take too much there. Um, similarly, you might be Brexit ready, as they say, um, but you need to check both your suppliers and your customers to make sure that they're equally ready. Um, and I know Jason's got some good insights around what Amazon, Amazon and third party logistics uh, coming up. So um, there, there's some of the things that we can be thinking about and doing. Um, from my perspective, I think it's also very, very important um, if we do not get a trading deal with the EU um, immediately, um, if we have no deal, we'll fall into World, Tra uh, World Trade Organization tariffs, um, and uh, I talk a little. I'll talk a little bit later in terms of some of the key businesses that will be significantly impacted by those tariffs. Um, I think, as a final thought, in terms of things to think about, um, is is if you have payment flows. Um, and I'm talking about here a perhaps a global organization that needs that has maybe a UK or EU subsidiary and been below it they 
have a subsidiary. If you, would, if you are currently thinking about paying a dividend or interest or royalties up from those countries, um, from the EU to the UK, or to a certain extent, UK to the EU, um, it might be strategic to make those payments before um, the 29th of March, um, when potentially, at the moment, EU directives exempt those sort of um, transfers. Um, post the 29th of March, there is no guarantee. And each individual EU country has their whole, um, it fall, effectively falls back to tax treaties and in reducing the rates at which they apply. So I think it's quite important that um, if you are thinking about um, relocating the cash, now it, it's good to, add, uh, to speak to local advisors in those areas. So moving on to the next slide, um, what can we expect after the 29th of March? Well, if a deal is agreed, we've got to remember this is only the first part. It is only a with, with withdrawal agreement. Um, the proper negotiations start um, probably towards the end of this year. Um, we've got the uh, European elections, uh, I think they're towards the end of May. We've got the summer break and then potentially we would expect some sort of negotiations for the trade to happen a little bit later. I think the message um, in the UK is that we've been very admiring of the uh, the EU27 so far. They've, 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 they've plotted quite a unified approach but I think as we as we move forward to a trade deal we would expect a little bit more vocal from the likes of Spain um, with Gibraltar Ireland with the border, we've heard quite a lot about that, and perhaps France uh, and the fishing industry and the access to waters. Um, and probably the thing that if, if we do not get, if we don't get any deal, is we would expect some sort of messy divorce. Um, I think I read commentary that um, we certainly know that the UK was a net contributor to the EU budget budgets, and I think there's a there was a 10, 10 billion pound black hole or something like that per year, which needed to be filled. Um, the provisional um, arrangement has put um, a £39 billion tag, but I think both sides, the EU and the UK, look at this from slightly different angles. Um, of course, with the elections coming around um, in the EU we, EU, we expect a little bit of posturing and of course, um, whilst we're not due a general election, I think if the outcomes aren't as expected, um, I would not be, ex be surprised to see a general election um, in some shape or form in the relatively near future, post the, the 29th of March. So very much that's where we set the scene. Um, I'm going to move away from business just for a second and focus on people and hand over to Caroline a little bit here in terms of what should EU citizens be thinking about and how can employers help? Thank you, thank you Andrew for that introduction and, and yes, although it might seem a, a strange topic to, um, to start a, a session that's being given by accountants because sitting in the UK, um, legal and accountancy firms are separate and we are definitely not, not lawyers. Um, I think people are, are probably quite the impact on people is, is quite a, an overriding factor within the UK um, consideration and, and, and needs to be given some, some proper thought, really. Um, the, um, the, the sort of bullet points that I want to talk around, though I'm perhaps changing slightly the order, is, is in terms of, of what we understand the arrangements to be for EU citizens living in the UK now and in the future but also just sort of touching base on, on why, as companies, um, employers should be worried about such uh, issues. And perhaps that's, um, that's a place to start, really, is, is that. And, and the, key, the key to that, really, is, um, is access to employment resource. Uh, and um, as, as I think is a common trait around every country that I ever talk to, um, employment and availability of, of skilled professionals is um, is a key concern, um, and I think that stretches across all, all sector groups. 
So the concern really with post-Brexit is, is if we shrink still further the, the availability of the UK labour pool, how that will impact on, on, um, on our companies in the UK. Um, and as such, I think employers really should be taking, um, taking time to identify uh, which of their staff may be affected from this process um, and, and putting some, some consideration as to how they can help and, and, and provide assistance as they, they work their way through that. Um, and also think a bit about some staff planning. You know, if you have EU staff who are currently either working outside the UK or contemplating sort of taking on some assignments outside the UK, you might just need to think about how that would impact on their future status. Um, there are a number of organisations I made reference to who are providing sort of um, providing some guidance and it's maybe a way of showing showing some, some support to EU citizens that are employed in the UK. So I think that's that's really why I think think it's important that this this question was put so early on in our, our um, presentation. In terms of the actual position for EU citizens um, and their families, um, we have what's what's called the settlement scheme that's going to be put in place. That um, essentially citizens living in the UK as at the end of December 2020 will have until June 21 to make an application for status under the citizen scheme. And essentially, um, most citizens and families who've been continuously resident in the UK for five years will be allowed to stay indefinitely. They will obtain what's, what's referred to as settled status. Um, if by December 20 they've not been in the UK for five years at that point, they'll be eligible for what's referred to as pre-settled status, which will enable them to stay in the UK until they can apply for settled and once you've got either settled status or pre-settled status, you have the same access um, as, as EU citizens currently do to public services in the UK. So that's the general scheme that's there. Um, the Home Office have, have issued a statement of intent that, that suggests that they will not require EU citizens to demonstrate that they've been working, studying or are self-sufficient in the UK, that they're just going to perform identity and criminality checks only. But clearly at the moment, we're only into our, our test phase on that, so, so we can't really comment further. The process is designed to be straightforward um, with a, a predominantly online um, process, short application. Uh, there are some some qualification issues if you've not if you've been absent from the UK for periods, but there are there are ways you can get around that. So I think it's it's just a case of following the application through, um, and um, and working working that through. Um, for family members who aren't from the EU, I think it's much it will be an easier process for them if the EU citizen family members being granted settled status first, so that's probably the right order to do things. Um, and then picking up from where Andrew was talking before, um, that at this late stage, we do have to think still, if we don't get a deal, uh, if, if we're dealing in a sort of ideal position, what would happen then? Um, and the only the UK could have such a department, but we have a department for exiting the EU, um, who has confirmed that if we do leave without a deal, um, then EU citizens and family members here on that date will be able to stay by applying sort of a broadly similar process. But the timeline is brought forward to 31st of December 2020 rather than June 2021. And there's some transitional arrangements for EU citizens arriving after 30th of March 2019. Um, with a, a process to give the application to leave if they want to stay longer than um, longer than the standard three months um, system that we have a, a process um, and that's that's I think really really this, a very very brief summary of, of the um, impact for people um, but I don't think we can overlook it because it's a hugely emotional subject in the EU and in the UK at the moment, um, causing causing great deal of stresses and strains across all industries, but notably those 
those I think there are areas in London Andrew can comment more but in London you know far more um, significant population of EU United workers similarly in, in hospitality restaurant business it's, it's a it's a big issue um, I, I mean, I see that. Sorry, I, I think that's absolutely right, Caroline. I mean, I think to, to the credit of certainly the UK, and I, I, I think UK, the EU are in a similar boat, they are trying to address the uncertainty around settled status and people um, by putting in place um, uh, simplification processes. Um, so hopefully that side of things, whilst there is additional administration, um, people are a little bit more um, uh, informed than they were perhaps a few months ago. I think we, I think moving back to uh, businesses just briefly in terms of which ones are most likely to be impacted because again I think it's very easy for us to kind of go Brexit it's really important to, to the whole globe um, but in actual fact most of the challenges are around the EU UK border situation and I deal with largely um, a, a typical client of mine might be a US retailer and um, whilst in theory a lot of the um, the narrative will not be relevant um, I think what we actually see from a lot of the international retailers is that perhaps they utilize some of the mainline mainland ports um, for example Amsterdam Rotterdam um, I think Jason may be able to uh, come up further in those areas. Uh, I think the goods enter the EU at that particular point. The challenge, while current, the current challenge at the moment is they can be transferred over to the UK uh, without additional tariffs or consideration. Really, um, it's quite streamlined. I think the challenge is there. You know, without stating the obvious, is that they are then moving from the EU jurisdiction into the UK territory, which would potentially have additional consideration. So effectively what businesses, if you are a an international business that's delivering into the EU and then going and transferring goods across the EU UK border or, or the other way around if you're importing goods into the UK with a view to selling across Europe then there's going to be some additional challenges. Um, obviously delays um, and and for that reason, um, those uh, I've, I've touched on very briefly. Um, sales reps, um, we see this as very common structure that you set up a perhaps a UK company and you have light touch sales reps um, meandering across the EU, uh, trying to promote um, sales. And I think there's been a little bit of press in terms of how that might operate at the moment. Um, I would say that you've got to expect a, a tightening of rules. I think I would expect to see a little bit more focus, although that tends to be my preferred route on setting up local subsidiary companies, which can bring additional costs. So if you are setting up in Germany or France, I would expect, um, although take local advice on this, um, I would expect the advice to be, it might be sensible to set up a subsidiary. Um, I'm not sure at the moment, mm -hmm. Um, there's a great deal of um, legislative support for that, um, but it, it's certainly something that we're perhaps seeing a little bit more of um, and questions. Um, obviously, business with a heavy migrant or reliant migrant workforce, um, particularly the UK, um, are concerned in the agricultural sector in terms of over the summer months. Uh, we, we have people coming over and, and using that, they're all going to be impacted because it's not going to be so straightforward to do. And I touched on initially um, the World Trade Organization tariffs and particularly if you're in foods and agriculture, this is going to be a huge area for you. I've kind of highlighted on the slide some of the key areas. Um, someone was, um, I think I was talking to someone about uh, the fishing side of things. Um, the, the UK is one of the UK's favorite Foods is tuna, which isn't necessarily caught uh, locally, and I think coli is probably our most exported fish, and we don't actually eat very much of it in the UK. Um, so you're going to see tariffs potentially both ways, and let until we get that EU trade agreement in place, and that could be a while. 
as yet. Um, just to remind you, if we get a withdrawal agreement, hopefully we'll have a transitional period where these WTO tariffs won't apply. But of course, um, and ultimately we hope that that will be replaced with a formal trade agreement. So I think they're important um, areas to think about. And also, um, I think the, um, the one which the City of London have always been very mindful of is financial services. Um, I think the EU have always been very keen to introduce some sort of transactional tax um, on um, financial services. Um, I'm not sure the UK have got any plans to do that, but obviously um, that will be an interesting one to watch um, moving forward. Um, again, I'm going to hand back to Caroline once more um, and just talk a little bit more about contracts. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and again, it seems to be a recurring theme for me because, because clearly contracts is, is really an area um, for, for legal advice. But I'm conscious that we've had a few questions from certainly from my clients when I've been talking to them about the contracts. So I thought it was worth, worth um, just passing, passing some mention to this. Um, and the reality is that, that some contracts um, may not be impacted at all by Brexit, um, but almost certainly others, those that are intended to last for, for a period in the future, do need to take it into account, take Brexit into account, um, together with some changes that might come with that. So, so I, I guess our advice would be to make sure you, you do think ahead and, and get your contracts to be as Brexit proof as possible. Um, which I accept is a huge challenge when we don't really know what Brexit means yet. Um, so we just need to be conscious of points to be thinking of, um, of which one is, is just as simple as which, which law does the um, contract, uh, applies to the contract. Um, if they're silent, it will, will fall into the EU rules. Um, whereas if it, if it states explicitly English law or, or Spanish law, at least you've got some clarity as to, to what you are you are dealing with then. Um, at the moment, I think it, it's, it, it, and there's a danger this is too simplistic, but in very high level terms, um, EU uh, English law and EU law um, is, is pretty similar. Um, but of course, following Brexit, um, it depends really what, what our withdrawal agreement is. Um, I think you know if we have a, a withdrawal agreement that will at least in the short term save most of the UK's legislation to be in line with, with EU legislation. But if we if we aren't bound by future um, European court decisions, we could diverge over time, and so over time it might mean that that um, reference to which applicable law is is relevant will become more and more of an issue. Um, the other point I just wanted to bring across as a, as a point just for thinking about is if you've got in your contract um, clauses dealing with um, material changes um, in there, that which clearly are unlikely to be drafted with Brexit in mind, but you might, Brexit might constitute an event of default. So you need to look at the how that provision has been drafted, how it's there. there, 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 there. You have price clauses within your um, contracts um, that, that might need to be enacted on um, if, if the impact of Brexit is such that prices significantly change as they might do. Um, there may be um, your contracts might be involving movement of staff or goods around between the UK and the EU. Um, and Brexit might just cause a restriction on movement that might cause an impact on, on either the ability to serve that contract or the costs to doing that. So just need to um, just have in mind where those potential pitfalls might be in, in the contracts and, and review those um, as we try and work out what, what Brexit means. Um, and this is, is possibly a, a good time to move then on to the, the next, um, next slide because which is where Jason's going to come in because really this is this is linked to the supply chain and making sure that, that goes up and down you've got your contracts to be built up with your suppliers and your customers um, if Jason would like to, to add in now yeah yeah uh, uh, 
Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Caroline. Um, um, so, so I, 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 was I was listening, listening to the conversation, conversation and, 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 and I'm, 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 I'm just trying, trying, trying to get to the, 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 um, the audience um, 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 perspective, perspective from, from how it is, how it is in, in, in the, the uh, Netherlands. Netherlands. Um, what we see is that uh, we've divided the new inbound business into two sides. One is UK companies that are coming into Europe, and the other side is um, uh, US companies or uh, or um, foreign companies outside of the EU that have uh, have been established in the UK and now are thinking, all right, so what are we going to do with our supply chain um, now post Brexit? Um, uh, the ones that have, uh, we have identified that are the most uh, fearful of the Brexit is the ones that are serving uh, uh, B2C customers. Um, uh, th this is also a great time to actually take a look at where you're doing business. If you're a business uh, entrepreneur, you're a company, you're, you're looking at your customer base, you're trying to figure out um, where exactly uh, are my clients. Now, this is a good time to look at it. Um, as the Brexit approaches to see how can you strategically um, structure your supply chain. Now, what we saw here in the Netherlands is we've had a, we've seen about at least about 30, 40 companies um, that we, we have see, worked with that have um, realigned their supply chain where they say, well, you know, um, the EU is a big market for us. So what we're going to do is, um, we don't know how the deal is going to take place, so we're going to move a lot of inventory to mainland Europe, and uh, we, we might oversupply to mainland Europe, but that's okay. At least we know that we have the supply, and we can also meet our contractual obligations with uh, some of the providers that we work with. For instance, uh, Amazon. Now, if you're if you're working with Amazon, uh, you would have signed a contract, and in the contract, they they uh, guarantee a certain amount of uh, a certain time where you must deliver product to your end customer. And if that is not uh, adhered to, then you will be subject to fines. Now, even before Brexit took place, uh, we see Amazon already telling uh, UK businesses, US businesses, uh, Chinese businesses that you have to have uh, a warehouse in mainland Europe. You cannot just be doing business from the UK uh, mainly because of how yeah that the industry is developing in in, in the logistics industry because they see that um, it's now almost uh, standard practice that if uh, you order something online uh, you want to receive it the next day or in some cases even the same day with uh, Amazon Prime with uh, Alibaba with uh, they make all these promises and now with uh, the Brexit uh, uh, coming up. If can you imagine getting stuck at the border with all your products, and then you have a, a very angry customer sitting in uh, Germany or the Netherlands or France, and they can't uh, get their product? Yeah, that, that that puts you in a very sticky situation, except especially with uh, the big players like Amazon, because where they 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 first give you fines, and if you, you still are a repeat offender, they might even uh, delist you from their platform. Um, so. That is definitely something that uh, you want to take into consideration, especially when you're in the B2C uh, business. And when it comes to setting up uh, a warehouse, now, um, uh, UK businesses, US businesses, they don't need to worry too much about this. Why I say that is because um, uh, if you look at the infrastructure of how it is in Northern Western Europe, uh, Germany, Netherlands, France, Belgium, um, 3PL comes into play. You know, you have logistics providers that say, you know, we are dealing with uh, loads and loads of customers, so we can offer you great rates with uh, with your um, transportation, with warehousing costing. So you don't need to set up your own warehouse. You can just use 3PL providers to be able to assist you. And uh, the, the the business of uh, warehousing and transportation is a very low margin business. So the cost um, to uh, to uh, supply goods from uh, Europe is not a, not as expensive as one would think it would be. So if you're a UK business or you're a, a foreign company operating in the uh, in the UK and you, in the past you have set up the UK because that is your home ground, 
you, you should be thinking about uh, or considering um, setting up a, a, another operation in uh, mainland Europe just to be able to supply to your uh, customers' needs. Um, w w uh, I think um, Andrew touched on this a bit about the customs union, about the tariffs. Um, we don't know um, how the code is going to look like. Um, is it going to be a copy-paste of a, 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 a rebranded customs union? Uh, that's something that could also uh, come to play. Um, it, it's still a lot of questions in the uh, supply chain world that uh, um, is not uh, answered yet. Um, but that's okay. That, that, um, uh, what, what we are here to do is to pr provide you with the facts, uh, provide you with the trends, and um, and then you should be able to draw a good conclusion from what other companies are doing, what uh, what are the trends in the market, where the, you can see the politics coming into play as well. Um, now, in, in, at least for the Netherlands, uh, what you have seen is uh, a few, uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, a few UK companies that have uh, set up uh, the operations here. Uh, one of them is the Discovery Channel. There was a recent win for the Netherlands, and, and that had to do mainly with advertising uh, uh, licenses. So this is not so much to do with the supply chain, but has to do with um, can I uh, uh, do my advertising campaigns and, um, and uh, publishing um, in the EU uh, post-Brexit, and you, you, know, you require licenses for that. Uh, the BBC had also a similar challenge. They, they are looking into acquiring EU licenses so they can broadcast BBC channels in the EU uh, post-Brexit. So um, uh, what we also see is in the medical sector, uh, now um, I'm sure most of you are aware that the, the EMA, the European Medical Association, has moved to the Netherlands. And however, the um, businesses that are in the pharmaceutical industry um, they are going to have a really difficult time if uh, we don't have a deal in place. So they are also moving their licenses, their patents uh, to, to Europe as well. Um, th those are the big scales what we see happening. But also, you know, um, you might think, well, I'm a small business. I don't know whether this is all applying to me. I would really consider uh, researching about this, getting in touch with your local advisors, trying to get a brainstorming session going, trying to figure out, um, how your client base is looking like, um, how can I do risk mitigation for um, your business, and uh, if, if eventually uh, figuring out a game plan. Now, I, I, I can understand that you don't have all the answers crystal clear right in front of you, but at least you can try and figure out, okay, now, uh, if, if, if the deal is going this way, then I, I think we should go that way. If it's going, uh, if there is a no deal, then I I know what I should be doing next. Um, if you sit back on your couch and and think, oh, okay, we'll just see what happens when uh, it comes, it uh, might be too late. So um, I, I'm just speaking from um, the facts right now. Companies are uh, investing um, and taking time and looking at uh, what's available, consulting with uh, people. Uh, advisors uh, to give them the best solutions. Um, I, I know I should take uh, pick up the subject of subsidies a bit later, but if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just pick on um, to that slide really quickly. Kimberly, I don't know if you can switch it over to the subsidy page. Um, so here we go. So um, if, if you're a, um, um, a business that either does trade with the UK or your UK company that's trade with Europe, or you have significant trade, but you don't have an entity. The, the EU has been investing um, and putting uh, budgets aside um, to help uh, these companies to subsidize their advisory costs. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, go and take uh, advice from your advisors. So um, governments, like I can speak for at least uh, a few Western government, governments like uh, the Netherlands, France, Germany, they've all put aside uh, a subsidy uh, agreement that you can log on to uh, one of the government websites um, and you can look up what subsidies are available. And uh, some of them can go up to about 10,000 euros uh, per customer. So if, if you're engaging into a, a consultant that uh, that has to uh, prepare a plan for you, a Brexit plan, some of these costs can be subsidized um, 
by uh, your local government, depending on which country you're in. Some some EU states have not given that, um, but what we see is in the main market uh, that is available. Um, what I would also advise is um, 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 that there are government, uh, they call them the foreign investment agencies, and and there could be in your local city or they could be abroad. I would definitely um, get in touch with them. Like for instance, if you're thinking about um, setting up your new logistics hub in the Netherlands, uh, there are several organizations, and the main one is the NFIA. Um, this is a government-backed organization to help you uh, plan uh, your expansion, plan your uh, new supply chain. They they offer up um, really smart people who are experienced in business, who are experienced in supply chain, understand the dynamics of business, and you can sit down with them and uh, talk through about how do I hire people, where do I get a rental uh, agreement, uh, can you introduce me to potential uh, vendors and sometimes even potential customers. So I would definitely look into uh, investment agencies uh, to support you. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out because, uh, you know, there's money sitting there and uh, uh, you should make uh, the use of it. Um, Andrew, did you have anything you wanted to add on, on to this on the supply chain? I don't, I don't know whether I touched everything that we need to talk about on the supply chain. I Sorry, I might. Yeah, sorry. I, I think that I think the comment I raised earlier was that you just got to think about your whole supply chain, not just yourself. Um, you could be absolutely Brexit ready. You could be very prepared um, and then find that actually you were reliant on a key supplier of your own whose goods get stuck at the warehouse or at the border. Um, and similarly for customers, um, it, it, it's one of those where you might be working through and your key customer isn't Brexit ready and you you know I think probably one of the key themes are uh, and I think you've just sort of said it is you know let's talk about it we're not too far away um, to, to D-Day as such and um, those that are prepared uh, will, will hopefully flourish um, and those that aren't will be uh, the ones at the back of the queue <laughs> I think on a lot of this so um, yeah, no, key, key, key message are don't just think about yourselves. Um, make sure your key customers as well as your suppliers are all, um, all ready as well. So, okay. Um, do you want to go back one slide, for Caroline? Oh, thank you. I was just waiting for the mute. I would just first off just add, add really to what Andrew said of, about looking at the whole supply chain and what we what we're starting to see now. Um, I don't know if Andrew's had the same, but is is clients of ours who supply EU businesses um, being asked effectively to to provide a guarantee of continual. Um, continuation of the supply post Brexit, which is which is quite hard for a UK client to do, but that's what what they're being asked asked to provide. So that's a, a bit of an interesting development we've just noticed in the last the last few um, weeks, really, very very recently. So um, this neatly takes us to to the next slide, which is to preparing for disruption at the borders. Um, and I think you know as, as I've noticed, Notice the uh, preparation is, is definitely varied when I talk to, to clients and, and people I, I come across. Um, and that variation in, in the degree of preparation straddles all ranges of, of industries and, and sizes of business. But you know, quite quite significant UK businesses that are, are, are not making particular plans, which surprised me. Um, and other other very, very small tailored ones who are, are very, very focused and got, got plans plans well in order and I think part of it is 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 the point that Jason just just made reference to before of this we don't understand we don't know what Brexit is so how can we plan for what we don't know um, and that, that's quite a, a difficult position to overcome at the moment um, and perhaps uh, maybe controversially say not helped by by some of the the news and the media sort of portrayal um, we're almost getting 
getting immune to the, the thoughts of, of sort of an Armageddon and, and, a, and you know, crisis um, management position that, that will occur. But, but I think at the same time, um, certainly before we, we came on live, Jason was, was talking about sort of logistics um, specialists who, who are really concerned about the blocks and, and the court and the, the docks and, and the ports in the UK and how, how we can get um, lorry traffic across the um, channel and through the ports and through the, the customs clearances. Um, in anything like a, a, an organised and, and smooth manner, um, and we just don't know. Is, is unfortunately the, the, the message. The, the government are, are sending out lots of messages of of, um, of support and reassurance, but at the end of the day, we just we just don't know. So what what we want to look at here is is really what what can be done to to at least at least what can companies sort of do in terms of their own um, systems and processes to to help um, minimize the impact of this disruption um, and and really this is where talking to an import export agent might just be the the right um, right way to go even if you don't use one at the moment that might just be the way of, of easing the burden with you um, and, and clearly very close liaison with, with any logistics partner is 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 vital really as we do that um, one one simple thing that that does make um, does make your trade easier between the UK and the EU is if you can make sure you have what's called an EORI number um, application which is a simple process to to register with with re, um, revenue and customs but does just help the whole process so we, so i would would definitely recommend you speak to advisors and, and make sure you have your eori number to hand moving forward um uh, turning to that really what i want to talk about is is what what might happen if there is no deal um how we how we might might manage that um because essentially if if there is if there is no deal um, UK businesses will have to apply the same processes to EU trade as apply currently when they're trading with the rest of the world. Um, and that really means that um, a declaration of, of, of goods to be for clearance and, and duty and tax to be paid up front. But there are a, a number of procedures and simplifications that are in place that can help help this trading position and, and really there's a bit of a campaign on now with HMRC to try and make sure as many traders as possible use use the right simplification to help keep the trade moving. Um, so, so again, my, my first sort of recommendation is that you do speak to your advisors and make sure you are in the in the best possible place in in terms of these procedures. Uh, a lot of them are bunched up under this this, this sort of concept of transitional simplified procedures. Which which are, are aimed to make um, importing easier at least until July 2020, um, and so it's just helping us through this transition period. It allows you to bring goods into the UK without having to make the full declaration in advance, and it allows you to defer um, the VA, the payment of the duties of the VAT um, for a period of time. So clearly, in terms of cash management, that's that's very helpful. Um, there is a, a, another procedure to, called the Customs Freight Simplified Procedures, um, which is another way to access this sort of simplified processes. But you do need HMRC authorization to use that. Um, and rather unhelpfully, I think if you haven't had that authorization now, you're not going to get it in time for the 29th of March. Um, so, so that's not. Um, that's not overly helpful unless, of course, you do use a customs agent to do your importing through because they are, are likely to have that, um, that process in place. Um, I think um, the, the other thing to, to, to remember really is that there are, there are a whole gamut of, of adjustments of, of release for if, um, if goods are only coming into the UK temporarily. For example, if you, you want to bring Bring samples, or um, um, one that's been key to me. My husband's a musician, so he, it, although it's the other way around, when he he, he goes to Europe with, with traveling as an orchestra, that would cover if it was a European orchestra coming to the UK. The instruments coming in, it's only temporary, so you don't you can get a, a 
an, an admission waiver for, for such things. And you just need to make sure that we've, we've thought through all those, um, all those aspects. Um, similarly, if goods are being moved across across countries, um, across multiple borders, you need to look at, at using a transit declaration for that. Um, but I think the key message is really is, is, is just spending some time to look at what the flow is of your goods from where they start to where they finish um, and, and, and address where the, the pinch points within that movement might be and how you can best manage that, both to allow the goods to move at the right time and the right order, but also to, to minimise the cash impact of, of the duty payments as, as we go through. That would be my, my summing up, really, of, um, of the border. I'm, I'm possibly not in Kent, but I think it might be a little bit, bit um, congested there for a while. Um, um, you know, one thought just comes to mind um, from, I was in another Brexit discussion this morning and we had a guy from an FX uh, company that does currency trading and current, they hold positions. So, um, and I think it's, this more relates to the uh, contract slide. And uh, he mentioned to me that, uh, or he mentioned to the group actually, that um, you would um, lock in contracts when you're getting into commercial deals in the past, so all contracts that was done before Brexit, um, that was already locked in. And uh, now um, you're at the, the stage where we don't know what's going to happen uh, one month from now. And um, and uh, you might have already locked in a contract where you know what your profit is going to be, you have uh, an estimation of uh, the... Sorry about that. Um, so, um, what what you want to consider is um, consider getting into um, uh, forward contracts um, with uh, with a good FX agent, uh, just so that you can lock in the price um, of your deal and you know um, what exactly you're going to be earning um, from. Uh, because um, he, obviously, the FX guy he said, I can't give you any advice. I can't tell you what's going to happen, um, but he was indicating to a certain extent that uh, the pound might drop for a, uh, uh, for a period of time, and it has been dropping already for the last few months. So um, when you're in these long contracts, please, please go take that into consideration on, on how you're going to mitigate the FX uh, risk for your business. Yeah, no. I'll hand it back to you, Caroline. No, that's a, a very valid point, and I think, um, I mean, cur currency um, fluctuation is all, always a, a, an issue for any company, isn't it? That's, that's trading cross cross borders, um, and 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 um, uh, one message we frequently would would say is is that by by fixing your rates, you, you might not get the best rate, but at least at least you know what you're working with to to manage your business properly so, so i think that's a very valid point very valid point to make um so i think kimberly's moved us to, to the next slide which is which is maybe um maybe not not one you would expect in, in a topic on on brexit but uh, but somehow cyber cyber security always seems to be on on everyone's everyone's list and and i think it's it's probably recognized as as, as one of the, the top if not the top business risk um according to many sort of risk barometer Survey. So, so I thought it was worth just just mentioning whilst we were we talking across the um, across the the whole the whole remit. And I think it, it links really in many ways back to to the slide where we were talking about people and the impact on people. That that um, again, there's there's a risk of a, a sort of shrinking talent pool for um, security practitioners as, as much as any other area. Um, and therefore, having having the right resources to protect us. Um, and I, I think the the other thing is that so sort of historically, there is, we see a surge in cyber attacks in in, in hashing hacking into systems uh, happening after natural disasters or sort of world um, world events sort of impacting on the economy. And so there's no reason um, not to think that that might happen again with with Brexit. And um, unfortunately, it's always a case that 
uncertainty creates opportunities. And whilst those opportunities are good when they're in the right hands, um, they can be particularly horrible if they go into the wrong hands. Um, and and uh, you can imagine an increase in sort of online scams um, related to immigration status or, or availability of state benefits, anything that preys on people's concerns um, and confusion there. So, so really, this is just a, a very quick um, a quick reminder that, that for us to, I know, certainly I'm talking to all our clients, uh, to, to make sure to take care um, when online, sort of in the immediate post-Brexit, post just to, to, to remember all your cyber security precautions in place. Um, so thank you very much on um, cyber security. Sorry, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm talking an awful lot, so I do apologise to everyone. Um, because the next slide happens to be me as well, um, which is on on GDPR. So I, I've really got the um, the bullet here of the best best topics. Um, GDPR, everyone's everyone's favourite. Um, and I think at, at the moment, as far as the UK is concerned, anyway, the um, uh, the GD, this rules governing the collection and the use of personal data are set at a, at a EU level within the UK legislation. Um, and under um, GDPR rules, um, we, we're only able to transfer personal data outside the EU if um, there's a legal basis for doing so, but transfers of personal data within the EU itself aren't, aren't um, restricted. But if there's no deal, um, then we've got no agreement, no, no um, agreement in place for the future arrangements for data protection. UK standards would remain as they are under the, the Data Protection Act um, of 2018, but it would mean that we would need to um, take action to ensure that EU organisations are able to continue sending us the personal data. I think. That really depends on EU law. I think in the UK, um, we expect that we, we will be allowed to, to continue the free flow of data from the UK to the EU, um, but that will be under under review. So really, it, it's again another case of, of watching the space, really, and making sure that um, that we keep on top of, of the changing legislation as it, as it evolves once we know what, what Brexit means. Thank you. I think the next slide is, is over to, um, to Jason again. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, 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 I picked up on this uh, a bit earlier on, um, on, on some trends that we talked about. What we see is uh, companies that are mainly coming in uh, to Europe and setting up shops are, um, uh, businesses that are um, um, that have a very strong um, uh, base in in Europe, um, they have significant revenues that come from Europe, and uh, and uh, well, they have set up a, a, an entity uh, just to mitigate that risk in case of whatever disruptions that might happen. Uh, so, so usually businesses that have a big presence uh, in the EU, that's one number one. Uh, why? Uh, because they're also interested in. Uh, acquiring the talent pool of the EU market. So regardless of what way the, the, the Brexit goes, um, they're still able to uh, acquire the staff that they need to do the business that uh, they're in. Um, uh, today morning I heard about uh, a UK company setting up shop in uh, Czech Republic uh, just so that they have access to talent, access to the talent pool, regardless of whether they can bring them back to um, the, e, the, the UK or not, but they still want to be able to acquire them and to get the job done. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the companies that are very prone to licensing agreements, that they, or I should say licenses, that they need to acquire a certain license to operate. Um, those are the ones that, are, that we see are the early movers into the EU and setting up shop. Um, and um, and of course, I, I, think, I think I mentioned this as well about the B2C uh, kind of businesses that I have uh, web shops that uh, need to supply within a, a short period of time. Uh, they're engaging local providers, they're sometimes even uh, uh, importing directly to the port of Rotterdam um, or Hamburg, wherever that they, they feel that is most comfortable for them to uh, set up their logistics hub. 
uh, we see them also moving uh, early, the early movers uh, towards uh, EU. Um, now the business model, yeah, as I said, you know, uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, Caroline picked up on this a little bit about the VAT. Uh, this is something to be uh, very mindful of on, on how this will impact your pricing. Um, uh, do, is it going to increase? Is it going to re reduce? Is, do we have to charge? Do we not have to charge? Um, and this can all, uh, especially if you're a consumer, I mean, if it's a B2B, it's not that much of a big difference because you eventually get back the money. But if you're a B2C business, you have to even um, think about how this is going to affect your pricing scheme. So VAT will be uh, yeah, a, a big question mark. Um, understanding your business model, and that mainly is on how you're going to run your business and how will the new costing uh, of uh, a post-Brexit uh, environment impact your profitability. Uh, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, most companies should be sitting down right now with their finance teams and trying figuring out, um, uh, doing a bit of role play exercises, uh, seeing in a new scenario if we increase our cost by X, how is our profitability going to decrease or increase by Y? Um, so these are the tests that I think we should be doing. Um, that's on point two, and and lastly, uh, um, we talk about uh, you know we're big fans of uh, data because uh, we should use data to be able to make decisions instead of feelings. And uh, what we see is um, with uh, U.S. companies that are now coming into uh, Europe. Uh, traditionally, in the past, a lot of them have been um, first, you know, the first place where a U.S. company would go to straight away to the U.K. And, and it was great because they still have access to the uh, European Union. They all speak English. It, it just made sense. But now we see a bit of a trend where uh, U.S. companies are skipping, uh, let's just say, the stopover in Heathrow Airport and um, also uh, going straight to certain European countries where they think they can uh, uh, open up shops straight away and start doing business just in case uh, no deal comes to play or, or we cannot help our find a solution for uh, um, for this Brexit situation. Um, uh, if we talk about the Asian players like China, Japan, these are the main investors into uh, EU. Um, we, we don't see that much of uh, movement from them. I think that they are just uh, waiting uh, uh, till till something is more concrete, uh, more uh, a, a better plan is already put on table where they know how to move. Um, what we do see with uh, European, I did mention that uh, bullet, but European uh, businesses now they have allocated let's just say 20 million aside to to invest, and they are not uh, especially the family businesses are not moving straight away into the UK right now. They, they, for, for businesses, uncertainty is uh, something that uh, is a big no-no, and uh, for businesses, they, they cannot tolerate that. So um, they're holding off uh, investments into the UK um, and moving towards uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and if, if, if something good comes out of the Brexit, then, then they might shift their attention back uh, to the UK. But I think, uh, as for now, they're, they're, they're sitting on top of their treasure chest, uh, waiting for the next news to come. So those are the main trends I see in uh, in mainland Europe. Um, so so we we, uh, we I set up another slide, um, and um, this, this is this is not not so much a, a, a cold hard facts here, but uh, uh, Europeans have uh, a strong relationship with with the UK. Uh, um, so. Uh, if you if you talk to an average European or a German or a Dutchman and you ask them, hey, do you guys know what's going on? And they say, not really. I, and do you understand the Brexit? They will also say, not really. Uh, they all you know they, they think that you know the Parliament is supposed to make a decision. And, and now it's more of like a people Parliament. It's a, quite of a mixture. But uh, that doesn't mean that um, Europeans uh, do not have. Uh, Sentiment of uh, or uh, share in this uh, troublesome time with with, uh, with uh, uh, the UK citizens. So um, you know, uh, service providers, customers, they're going to be faced conference calls and meetings, and um, 
uh, it would be handy uh, if you're if you're a UK business to come with your EU uh, counterparts and uh, and vice versa the other way as well. Um, I mean, amidst of all these uh, challenges, I, I'm I'm sure that uh, all of us want to have the a good deal for both parties. All of us still want to do trade with each other, especially in the business community. It's, it's, it's the politics generally doesn't drive the business community, but profitability does. So, if, if both parties can come out uh, winners in this uh, in this uh, with this Brexit uh, movement, then yeah, it should be good. Um, Jason, could I just say, I'm conscious that it's it, we're at the hour mark, so I just want to wrap up from a UK perspective. Um, basically, the message, the message from Caroline and myself are, um, yes, there's been some anticipation on the of Brexit, but we are seeing some movement. There are some clarifications in, in recent months and um, if not weeks. You've got some options around imports. Um, be prepared. The key issues are around the EU and UK borders. Um, you can look at each one on a case by case basis. HLB work really close together, so effectively come and talk to us. Um, the UK is very much open for business, but very much consumer population, focus, big focus on tech and retail. Still a very large economy, um, and we're very much open for business. We've touched on reduction in, in pounds, that can be a good thing in terms of operational costs in the UK. Um, conversely, lower pound means perhaps lower revenues and lower margins for you. Um, but yeah, I think from our perspective, we're open for business um, and we get on very well with our EU counterparts. And uh, um, here's to a prosperous future. Great. I, thank you so much. Jason and Caroline and Andrew for your insight into Brexit. I know it's going to be a challenging month ahead and maybe even few years hearing, you know, maybe it's going to be December 2020 or December 21 before we have this finally resolved. So we will all stay tuned. We will all be watching what's going to happen. And uh, it's challenging times in international business, to say the least. Um, our next HLB International Tax Webinar will be on Tuesday, March 26th, at the same time, 10 a.m. East Coast US, 3 p.m. in the UK, 4 p.m. in Central Europe, and it will be on indirect taxation, so the VAT. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, a, a huge, huge thank you again to our panelists.